Okay, so introductions. Hi, I'm Matt Davis. Um, I'm in charge of this thing, but uh, I'm actually going to be at the front of the room, not a whole lot. So let me introduce Software Carpentry. You all have done your research or done your work, whatever it is you do. Um, you have probably figured out that programming is a pretty big part of your life or is becoming a pretty big part of your life. Going along with varying degrees of success, uh, it was certainly a pretty bumpy road for me the first couple of years. Um, I was doing a lot of programming. And what they don't tell you in school a lot of the times is that programming is a full-time job for a lot of people, right? Obviously. Um, I'm one of those people. Those people, software engineers and professional programmers who have been doing this, for, who have been coding for a long time, have uh, gotten frustrated with all of the same things that you get frustrated with as, as a programmer and have invented different tools and different uh, techniques and best practices for dealing with those frustrations. Researchers don't get exposed to those things. And that's what Software Carpentry wants to do. Software Carpentry wants to help you learn a lot of the tools and techniques that professional software programmers use to keep themselves sane, writing code all the time. As someone who writes code pretty much all day, every day, I can tell you that everything we are going to teach you about is the only thing that has kept me out of the insane asylum. Like, it's absolutely critical once you get more than like waist deep into code. So this morning, we are going to talk about the shell, or a terminal, uh, which is a way of giving your computer commands by typing. That might seem a little slow and uh, burdensome at first, but you're going to see actually how powerful it can be. Way back in the day when computers filled up rooms, typing was the only option you had for talking to your computer. But people still needed to do all of the things you do today with your mouse and the fancy windows and everything. They invented a lot of really powerful shortcuts for getting all of that stuff done. Short commands and clever ways of doing things to get all of that stuff done very quickly just by typing. We probably, I think probably all of us as instructors spend all our time in the terminal and not a lot of time looking at Windows. And then this afternoon we'll start covering Python, which is what you're all here for obviously at, the, at SciPy. Um, but we'll just introduce Python and get you used to the Python syntax and doing basic things in Python. Tomorrow morning, we'll talk about Git, which is a version control system, which is a way of tracking changes to your code so that as you're working, you can always say, you can make little check-ins of your code, little snapshots, and always be able to return to them. So even if you have really wild ideas about crazy things you want to try, end up changing half of your code, and then it doesn't work out and you have to go back, you didn't have to make any copies, you didn't have to do anything fancy, you can use Git to go right back to where you were, no harm done. And then tomorrow afternoon, we'll introduce some of the scientific Python libraries that you're going to hear about for the rest of the conference, kind of get you started on that. A very quick introduction to everything we're going to cover, so it's going to go fast, and we're going to give you a lot of information. On the topic of meeting your neighbor, it's a good idea to be sitting next to somebody, besides one of us, sitting next to, <laughs> uh, to be sitting next to a fellow student so that you can work together. When we're doing exercises and having downtime, we love to hear lots of chatter. Um, we want you all talking to each other, getting to know your neighbor, and collaborating. When we do exercises, they're not quizzes, they're not tests. It's absolutely the best if you actually talk to each other and work through the things together. You will learn better that way. All right, let's give it to Jens. Start off with the shell session today, and um, this is the example of the shell running on my computer. We'll start with, um, with pretty basic stuff to get this working. Um, it would be good if you could start by creating a directory somewhere on your computer and calling it uh, something with shell, software carpentry shell, and then we'll work with, from that directory and put all our files in there that we will manipulate with. And follow this link uh, to the materials on the software carpentry, and then you can see here it says download, and there's a file you're asked to download. So please go ahead and do that, download that file. And when you've, once you've downloaded it, then unzip it and move the, uh, the data folder into the directory that you just created. You should just use your regular uh, Finder, Windows Explorer, or Linux uh, thing to move the files around for now, and then we'll show how to do it with the terminal later on. 
Yeah, so on the Mac, um, I'm using one called iTerm, but it really doesn't matter. Normally, you would just you can do use your spotlight search and type terminal, and then you'll get this window, which are for all practical purposes exactly the same thing. It's not crucial exactly where you've got that folder. We just want you to have the folder data somewhere in your your home directory, so we can work with stuff in it. The the data directory. So the data directory should call should contain four folders called bin, data, temp, and users. So once you've opened the terminal, then you can use ls to see what's in your folder, but we'll show that later. So once you've downloaded the file, um, the folder, and placed it somewhere, we should be able to navigate into that directory. In my case, I left the data inside the directory called SciPy2015. So I'll do cd SciPy2015 press enter, then I've navigated to that directory, and then I'll do cd data, and navigate into that directory. Then I can use the command ls to see what's actually inside the directory. And in this case, there are four folders called bin data, temp, and users. Let's carry on. Seeing that we've seen just a little bit of how we can navigate, and we navigated in, you should always all be in the position of having used cd, which is short for change directory, to navigate into the, to the folder that we downloaded, and ls, to list the contents of the folder. And we see that this contains four different directories. Now, Math already gave sort of a brief introduction to what the shell is about, uh, so I'll go right into actually starting to use it. So we are, in this case, we are, this data folder that we downloaded represents the contents of someone's computer. So we can, use, we can use the command pvd for print work directory to see where we are. So in this case, it tells us that we're inside the users jhn, which is my username, sci-fi 2015 data directory. And that directory contains these four folders. On Linux machines, then, it will store stuff under home rather than users, but the principle is the same. On the Windows machines, git bash represents this a bit differently, and it starts with a, with a slash c for your c drive. But the principle remains the same. This slash at the beginning represents the root of your machine, so the very top-level directory. So if I do cd slash, then I'll be put at the very top of my machine, and I do ls, then I can see the contents of that thing. If you do ls.f with a, with a large f, then it will give you some help. So we'll put a slash at the end of some of the folders that shows that these are actually folders, where stuff that doesn't contain a slash is, is a file. Um, in my case, I've set something up that, that colors them so to represent the same data. But you can lose, use slash f to show that. Um, so I'm going to navigate back home to my, my home directory, which was slash users jhn. And then we're navigating into the scipy directory and the data directory. Now, this data directory contains the home folder of another person's computer. So we're imagining that we're working, um, we're going through some data analysis that Nell wished to perform on data that she's collected in a uh, scientific expedition to the uh, Plastic Isles out in the North Atlantic. And she's collected a whole bunch of data that she needs to run the same script on over and over again. But she's collected several hundred files. Each of them takes a few minutes to process, meaning that if she had to process all this data manually, she would have to be every second minute typing in a new file name, pressing OK, doing the analysis, and then moving on to the next file, which will be tedious and obviously not a good way to spend her, her scientific research time. So what we're going to focus is on is to show how we can use the shell to automatize these kind of tasks so that you just have to start it once 
and then it goes through the analysis of all the data files. So a few other basic things that we can show. We've shown um, ls to see all the, the directories in there, ls slash f to show that they are what's directories and what's files. We've shown that we can use pwd to tell us where we are. That can be very important because obviously we could have several directories on inside each other. They could even have the same name. So if you don't, if you don't remember where you are, then you can easily get lost. So then pwd comes in handy as a way of telling you where you are. Um, another command that you can use is who am I, which will tell you which user you're logged into on your machine. In most of the cases here, you will be running at your laptop, so you will probably be the only user of that machine. Um, but for some of you, you might want to use this to do data analysis on a, on a supercomputer or department cluster or something like that, where several hundred different users can exist, so you can confirm that you're actually logged in as the user you expect to be. So what actually happens in the background here is that once, when I type in this, then the shell goes ahead and interprets that I want to run a progra program that's called who am I. I can use the command which to tell me which version of where this program is that I'm going to run. So in the folder, user slash bin, there's a program called who am I, which is the one I execute when I type who am I. So what happens when I do this and press enter is exactly the same thing that would happen if you had a program on your desktop which was an executable and you double clicked on it to run it. The program runs and then it prints out some output and so forth. We can explore a little bit more of what's inside this data directory. So we can see that this contains a users folder. This, imagine that this was the, that the directory data here is the root of Nell's computer. Then we can see that in the same way as I've got my users JHN, then this one's got users. Then there's Nell's home directory, Larry's home directory, and Imhotep's home directory in here. LS has several other options that we can show, so we can see what's inside Nell's directory by doing LS Nell without actually going in there. We've seen how we can navigate forward um, by doing CD, so we can do CD Nell. If we actually want to go back to the directory where we just came from, then we use the shortcut CD double dot. So double dot is a shortcut for the directory just above the one that I'm in. So we do pwd and we do cd dub, dot dot. Then we can see that we've moved up one directory. The other way of navigating is, of course, that we've shown that we can do we can do it via an absolute path. So if we start if we start with a slash, then we signal that this is an absolute path that begins at the very root of our machine, and then we can type in all of it. But obviously, doing that every time you want to move somewhere gets tiresome and cumbersome. Any questions about these basic navigation around folders? Should probably spend a few minutes experimenting, going back and forth into various of Nell's folders, and making sure that you're comfortable with going in there and going out again and exploring what's in these folders inside data. So on most machines, you can actually tap complete. So when I do CD, I type the first letter and then press tap. Then it will automatically look which things can you CD into that starts with a U. In this case, the only possibility is users. So that comes in handy. If I press tap again, then if I keep pressing tap, it will eventually show me the possible things that I can complete it to, which can save you a lot of time because you don't have to CD, do LS, CD, do LS, but you can actually just type tap. So we talked about that, that this is going to be, a, we are going to use this example of um, Nell's research data from the North Pacific 
guy of uh, some samples that she's drawn out there. So we can look at what's inside that folder. So we've got a small sample here of, of some text files that she's that been recorded containing sample data. And then there's a few programs here that we need to run on our goo data to do the analysis, which is what we'll be working on for um, working towards doing the last of this morning's lecture. So we've got a few um, questions and exercises to see if we've understood what's, what we've been teaching so far. So let's try talking about those. The idea is that we've got this file system that, like I've shown, starts with users. And there are two users, thing and backup, and they've contained some folders. Um, confusingly, some of the names are the same. And then we are asked if PWD displays users thing, what will ls double that dot slash backup display? Does anyone want to venture a guess on one of these four options? Will it show double dash backup, no such file or directory? If it doesn't exist, will it show these lists? Of things, of things starting with 2012, 2013, and 2013, will it show them which slash is on, or will it show original PNAS final and PNAS underscore sub? To begin with, we are in users thing okay. here. Then we do ls double dot slash backup. So the question, the basic question is, where will that take us? Because we're doing double dash, which takes us back up into users and then slash backup, which take us down into this backup folder and not into that backup folder. So that's the important thing and why um, stuff like PWD is useful because you can very easily come into the, the situation that you've got several different folders with the same name. For instance, here I've got my users folder and we've got the users folders inside, inside NEL, so it's important that we keep track of that these are two different things with the same name that are only separated by their place in the file hierarchy. We are inside users backup, and we're told that putting an ls, a hyphen r on our ls command displays things in reverse order. What will we see when we do, which command will then print uh, pnas sub, pnas final, and original in that order? So anyone want to come and venture a guess on which command we need to run? lspwd ls slash rf, ls slash rf, users back off, or either of number two or three. But not number one. Either Yes. Because number one is missing the r flag, so they will come in the opposite order. Um, this one will work because we're already in the right directory. And that one works because we tell it to start in the right directory, which happens to be the same as the one we are in. So these are two different ways of doing the same, either by relative path, aka nothing because we are already there, or by absolute path because we start with a slash. What does CD do if, it doesn't, if we don't put anything after it? Uh, that's probably fairly hard to guess if you don't know. Um, so we could try it out. So if I do CD and then nothing, and then PWD, it puts me back into my home directory. So that's a shortcut. When you've navigated to somewhere that you don't want to be on your computer, then you just quickly want to get back to your own home directory then you can just do CD, and it takes you right back there. The other important thing about home directories, which we'll revisit again, is what's printed before my username. So this has format of some name, colon, something, uh, and then my username. So in this case, the first thing is the name of my computer. Um, and then after the colon is the directory that we're currently in and then the username. Um, you can customize this prompt, but that's a bit more advanced than what we'll be working on uh, in the first instance today. But it displays, it displays your home, the directory that you're currently in here. So if you do CD 
and nothing, then it displays a tilde. And the tilde is an almost universal shortcut for your home directory. So you can achieve the same thing by typing cd tilde, and you can do cd tilde slash um, some directory inside your home directory to quickly navigate to that place. So that can come in handy in quite a lot of places. So that came from, from following this link. And then we are, we are working our way through the topics. So we are in the files and directories tutorial. And we were looking at the exercises questions towards the bottom of this one. So this diagram is there. Um, in general, almost all we say in this session, at least today, should be available um, via this link. And we have this link from, uh, from the, main, the main software carpentry. It might also come in handy here. So we work, we've been working our way through topic number two now. There's a reference uh, file here which may come in handy that contains um, introduction to what all these commands, short explanation of all the, all the commands that we're using and some more commands that we won't have time to cover are doing, so that's a basic uh, reference that's probably useful. From the, the shell side to references, and then you can have that open in a tab in the background as, a, as something you can look up and, and use. So this asks, what does ls do when we use it together with H, s and h arguments? Um, so we can try it out and see what happens if we do ls slash s. So that prints a zero. Um, it's maybe a bit hard to, to guess what that zero means, but let's try moving somewhere where we actually have got files and try it again. So it's clearly got something to do with that. The canonical reference, so if you want help with what these commands are, are man pages, which you access by typing man and then the name of the command. Um, so that tells us something about ls that probably doesn't work if you're on a Windows machine with, with git bash. Um, so the alternative is, one of the alternatives that you can use is to simply Google it. And you'll find the same, more or less the same text. You can also use the reference, of course, inside, um, if we read this manual, contains a lot of text, uh, but we're use, looking for what slash s is doing. How are you so I'm just, I'm just pressing the key down here to scroll. Yeah, so slash s is displaying. It has got something to do with the size of the file, but it's rather, uh, it's rather arcane in 512 bytes. So. Uh, that's not overly useful. You can use the slash capital S, which sorts by file size, which is maybe more interesting, which will then sort things differently from just doing ls. The other thing that we were asked about was slash h. Let's look at the man page. So we scroll down again. Obviously, one might wonder, how are you ever going to memorize all of these options to ls? And typically, you don't. There's a few of them that you find useful and you will memorize. If you need them, then you will use the man pages or you will Google to find if there are more options that you need for something special that we rarely use. That's H is in this case used to get sizes which are in bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, and gigabytes, and terabytes, and so on, rather than just showing a huge number. But it only works when you're actually using it together with the slash l option, which we didn't try. So slash l is printing it as a list, which shows, and it showed when the file was last modified, it shows who owns the files, then it shows something about permissions that we're not going to use, um, which is a bit above the level that we're going to consider today. This d shows that it's a directory and then this thing is the actual size of the file 
in number of bytes. But obviously, to figure out exactly what that is, you'd have to manually divide by a thousand and so on. So it's probably easier to read if you do like this, where it shows that it's where it actually uses the suffixes. So we can see that that file is 21 kilobytes. That one is 32 bytes. That one is 202, 202 bytes, and so on. Number of the size in bytes, then it shows the size in bytes or kilobytes or gigabytes according to what's appropriate for the given file size, which makes it humanly readable. So that's the idea that the H is indeed for, for humanly readable. We've played around with how we can navigate. We've seen that we can, we can see the contents of the file. Now we've also seen how we can tell how big they are. We've also seen that we can tell when they were last modified and so on. But all of this so far has been about watching stuff. We haven't actually created any files or modified any files or directories for that matter. So that's next up.